So, topic today is the illusion of separation. I like this uh, Buddha in the matrix as the uh, the icon for this. So, what we're interested in is what is reality, uh, perhaps with a small R or a big R. And most people, most of the time, think that reality is what we perceive. Well, what you perceive in this kind of optical illusion is that the tile A and B are different shades. And yet we know that this is not the case. And here's an animation showing that if you take one of the slides and move it somewhere else, it's exactly the same shade, but it looks different. So I want to check to make sure that you can see this correctly. Can you see it? Yes. yes. Okay. So the reason this illusion works is because our brain is tricking us that when we see a shadow, as in this case you put a, a tile into a shadow, uh, you will adjust what your perceived luminance is for the object. Here's another example. It's the same basic idea that against the background, uh, two tiles can look like they're completely different colors. And once again, it's basically a trick of the brain. And we can show that by just simply covering up the background. And if you do that and you complete it, you'll see that the gray colors are exactly the same. And then there's the original again. So this is not something that you can consciously control. This is something that your, your brain has learned over time about what shadows do to different colors. Uh, and basically showing you that uh, you can easily be tricked by what you see. Here's a uh, silhouette of a uh, spinning girl, and if you imagine you're looking down from above, and many people would look at this and say, well, she's moving clockwise. And yet, if you look at the girl on the right now, you'll see that she's moving from, from above, she's moving counterclockwise, and if you look at the girl on the left, you'll see that she reverses direction. So yet, and you can switch it easily, just look at the girl on the right or the girl on the left, and it'll switch directions again and again. And this is another kind of, of dynamic optical illusion, again showing you that our brains are very adept in, at fooling us. Here's another one having to do with foreshortening. This one, of course, taking advantage of, again, what you have learned about, perspec about perspective and your brain, once it has learned that, makes it very difficult to see it in any other way. Here's another example. Uh, these look like uh, three perfectly normal women, and yet if we turn it upside down, they're not so normal anymore. The reason this illusion works is because our brains are hardwired. And when you look at a face, you can very rapidly determine, does this look human or not? and you're not looking at the details. And it's only when you flip the image and you can see the details, it, you realize that these faces are not quite right. This is known to occur in a specific portion of the brain, the fusiform gyrus. Uh, it's a particular area of the brain that is hardwired to see faces. So again, we are not seeing the world the way it is. Subjective and objective realities aren't the same thing. And in general, we see what we expect to see. We also believe what we expect to uh, to see, and a philosopher might call this naive reality. Naive reality is a very thin slice of reality with a, with a big R, which only raises the question, well then, what is real reality? Well, we have a clue from physics about what real reality is, and of course, we're talking here about uh, the deep structure of the physical world, and maybe beyond, and uh, it has to do with the uh, transition between classical and the quantum domain. So in the classical domain, we have ideas that have arisen that are called things like locality, causality, a fixed reality, and space-time. So these are refinements of common sense. Locality means that uh, if you want to make something move, uh, you have to shove it. If you uh, want to explain how something works, we explain it in causal terms, that there's a series of things pushing on other things in a uniform time frame, unidirectional. Fixed reality means that if you're not looking at an object, that it's still there and still has the same properties that it had before. And space-time is considered to be an absolute. We know, however, for a hundred years now, that 
uh, if you start going down into the elementary world, uh, that locality turns into non-locality and causality into a causality. There is no fixed reality. There's a participatory reality where observation makes a difference. And there's not even any absolute space-time. So if we're interested in reality at a, at a deep level, what is, what's the foundation on which we sit? We already know, and this is no longer even theoretically true, this is empirically true, that what we're sitting upon is nothing like the way that our ordinary awareness feels. It's almost the complete opposite. So in this world of, of classical physics where we have to move our bodies around in airplanes and things like that, uh, we definitely see the world as separate, separate objects. The moment you cross that divide, though, there is no separation at all. Anything that you can think of as being separate objects that simply does not exist. Well, there are other hints about what real reality may be, and we can put them on this graph. The graph on the bottom is the emotional impact of an experience, and the left, or the vertical axis, is the frequency. So these hints are things like, uh, when we put it on this graph, uh, if you ask virtually any audience, have you ever had a gut feeling about something that turned out to be true? So this is a common and mundane effect. Feeling of being stared at, telephone telepathy, where you know who's calling without looking at the phone yet. Distant knowing, distant healing, premonitions, creative insight, religious epiphany, and somewhere near the top is full, full-blown mystical union. So who reports these things? Well, at the lower left, everybody reports these things at one time or another. I've asked uh, audiences composed primarily uh, people who are very skeptical about psychic effects of any type and asked some questions about gut feelings and feeling of being stared at. And usually about three quarters of the audience will admit that they have these, these um, experiences. What they won't admit is that they may have anything to do with being psychic because these are people who basically deny that such things can be true, and yet their own experience tells them that sometimes they have something like that. So everyone reports these effects at the bottom. When we start moving up on the scale, we should give them names like healers, intuitives, geniuses, prodigies, saints, yogis, and so on. The point of this is these, this is all part of a spectrum. I call it the extended capacities of the mind. There are lots of other terms that could be used. I use that term because... This is the phrase that we use at, at the Institute of Noetic Sciences to act as an umbrella to cover the entire spectrum. The curious thing about this graph is that these phenomena seem strange for one reason only. They suggest that mind transcends time and space. And this is true of, of basically this whole domain that we might call the exceptional domain or the noetic domain. Uh, the thing that makes them strange is it suggests that we're not actually as localized or as separate as we think we are. The other thing which is strange is that when the upper right side of this graph, these are very rare phenomena beyond the reach of science, but they're also well accepted. Everyone accepts that there are geniuses and saints among us. Those are the people who created civilization the way that we know it. And yet the other side of the graph, these are very common things, very common ex experiences. They're easy to study in the laboratory, but they're highly controversial from a scientific perspective. And I think one of the reasons for that is that people generally don't think of these kinds of effects as being on a, on a scale, on a spectrum. So the moment we get interested in uh, looking at the nature of reality, we have to leave our ordinary senses and to go into some other space where trees have hats. So what we have here are the, is the taxonomy of the way that the experiences have been expressed uh, basically from the beginning of recorded history. We call that experience where something is shared between people mentally at a distance. We call it telepathy. Psychokinesis is expressing your intentions into the world. Clairvoyance is getting information from a distance, otherwise known as remote viewing. And if it's slipped in time, it might be precognition, if it's a future effect, or retrocognition, if it's a past effect. So I'm going to spend a little time on telepathy. The way that telepathy has been studied in the lab most often, and there are a number of different ways that this has occurred, but it's called the Gonsfeld method. Uh, it requires two people, a sender and a receiver. The game is that the sender is going to try to send a thought to the receiver. We put the receiver in a condition where we shine a red light, 
in the, on their on their face. We take a ping pong ball, we cut it in half, and we put a ping pong, a half of a ping pong ball, over each eye. And the idea is that uh, the eyes are open, but everywhere you look, you only see red. So this is an unpatterned stimulus. We also do this for the ears. We take headphones playing white noise. You're probably familiar with something like that. Uh, and But it's just playing a, a hushing noise. So you can't see anything, you can't hear anything, but you're awake. Most people, after five or ten minutes of this kind of stimulation, go into a hypnagogic state, and it becomes easier and easier to hallucinate or to project internal imagery that you can both hear and, and see. We do that because we want to encourage the receiver to be in a dreamlike state and become very sensitive to any kind of external impression. So we want the sender to send thought or send an image to the receiver in that condition. So here's where we did these kinds of experiments. This is the, uh, the Institute of Noetic Sciences campus. We have, we have both a retreat center, which is what you're looking at here. This is a 200-acre property, so this is just one building of many. And we had our, our laboratory in the basement of this building. So we're going in the back of the building. Uh, and here's what it looked like a few years ago before we moved the lab to a different location. On the left there is our electromagnetically shielded room. <clears throat> it consists of almost 3,000 pounds of solid steel walls, double walls. Uh, it's grounded. It's a commercial box made for... Uh, testing equipment where you don't want somebody on the outside to be able to detect what you're doing. Uh, and we use it to make sure that if we put a receiver in a telepathy experiment in there, or receivers in other experiments, that uh, there's no ordinary way that you can communicate with them. So inside the box, we have a lady named Gail who's having the ping pong balls put on her eyes. And this is my research assistant, Lena. Uh, Gail is the kind of person who has lots of spontaneous psychic events in her life and I've uh, she's participated in many experiments that I've run because more often than not even under laboratory conditions she can be psychic. So we want the sender to send something to the receiver. We obviously can't simply have the sender think of something at random and send it to the receiver because if the receiver and sender know each other then they have shared memory and that will bias the results. So we give the sender a randomly selected image. We ask them to send it to receiver, and if the receiver is doing well, then they may get an impression of animals, maybe gray animals. If we're really lucky, they'll get African animals and so on. So they get an impression. And then after about 20 minutes of the sending period, we take the receiver out of the Gonsfeld condition, uh, and we play back anything that they had said to remind them what, they, what their impression was. And then we present them with four images, one of which was the actual target, and then three decoys. So the chance of getting the target correctly is one in four. There is no ordinary way that the receiver can do any better than one in four if telepathy doesn't exist, or if clairvoyance doesn't exist, or if any psychic phenomena didn't exist. Sometimes people say in this kind of experiment, well, don't you have a control condition? Well, this is a control. This is called a control by protocol, where if you think about it, if the receiver is getting no additional information, then there's simply no way on average that they can do better than one in four. That's the control. So here's an actual session that we did. These are the four images selected at random to be as different from each other as possible. And then this is what Gail said. And this is while she's in the Gonsfeld condition. She said something has a rough texture. It's tall. I'm looking up high, like in an art gallery or in a museum. A Yosemite kind of image of a tall rock, monolithic. I just say here that Gail said the word monolithic, but later said she wasn't quite sure what the word monolithic meant, but that it was somehow associated with this target. Images of Mount Rushmore and Half Dome, like a big stone. Half Dome is a big rock in Yosemite National Park. So these were her impressions. She then saw the four images. She selected one of them. Uh, you probably have a, a guess as to what the target was. And indeed, the target was the pyramid. So this would have been considered a hit. She got the one in four targets correctly and in one session. So the skeptics, of course, immediately want to know, well, that maybe if it's only one in four chance in one session, maybe that was, that was just a fluke. Well, what happens if you independently repeat this and you repeat it many, many times? What do you get? 
Well, this experiment or ones very similar to it have been conducted for many decades, many universities, many private institutions around the world. And so we can do a meta-analysis and see, well, how many times has this been repeated and by whom? Well, the answer is, as of a few years ago, 122 experiments reported from 20 laboratories around the world and 4,600 sessions of the type where Gale, the one with Gale was one session. And now you can plot in chronological order what was the average hit rate and what are the error bars for each one of these experiments. So if, at a glance, you can see that sometimes the experiment worked really well. You have high percentage hit rates, and sometimes it didn't work very well, but on average it looks pretty good. So it'll make it easier to see this on average by simply plotting it cumulatively. And when you do the, the cumulative hit rate, you see that there's where we end up. It's around 32% as a hit rate, and chance is 25%. So what is the odds against chance of ending up at that endpoint, where you can see that the error bars get smaller and smaller the more data you get? And the answer is the odds against chance are 300 trillion quadrillion to 1, or 10 to the minus 30th probability. This database has been stable now for about two decades. So this is not too surprising. If, if this were a, um, a fluke, and uh, you would expect the regression to the mean, which means that you collect more and more data in better and better conditions, and eventually the effect goes away. It'll go down to chance. But it's not going to chance. It's, it's stable, and it's saying that average people doing this experiment, you're going to get around a 32% hit rate. And we know that now with very high uh, confidence. This has been, in the lower right, you see their psychological bulletin. This has been discussed in one of the highest rated academic psychology journals now a number of times. Uh, so any psychologist, any academic psychologist, who tells you that there's no evidence for telepathy is not even reading their own journals. What does it mean to say that the odds are 300 trillion quadrillion to one? It means that if telepathy doesn't exist, then we could run the same experiment 300 trillion quadrillion times to get a result as good or as better than what we actually have observed. Or that it would take longer than the life of the universe to get these results by chance. That's based on uh, how long it takes to run one session. It takes roughly 90 minutes, or an hour and a half, to run one session. So we have 4,000 times 90 minutes, which gives the database that we see, but we have to then run it 300 trillion quadrillion times to see whether we get any results that are any better than what we've seen. And that's pretty unlikely. And every time we do an experiment, we always have a due diligence list where we want to make sure that we're not fooling ourselves and maybe there's a more mundane alternative explanation. So the dis experiments are designed from the get-go to make sure that we're not dealing with some sort of leakage between the people, sensory or information leakage, there's no recording mistakes, there's no randomization problems, experimental quality is as good as we can manage. Uh, the selective reporting issue, or the file drawer effect, has been studied in great gory detail, and this is referring to the fact that people tend to publish studies that are significant or positive, and they tend not to study or to publish studies that don't turn out so well. So there are ways of estimating how many non-significant or null results have not been studied. There are statistical ways of looking at that question, and in this case, it, you, you can come up with a figure it figure ranges between a couple of hundred to thousands of missing um, experiments, all of which would have to average to a null effect in order to see this outcome. Uh, the experiments are designed to prevent fraud on the basis of the participants and also on the experimenters, but the bottom line always is, and the question is always asked, well, maybe all these studies are being done by, by believers who are biasing the results in some way. So maybe it's not intentional fraud, it's, it's inadvertent fraud or inadvertent mistakes. So what happens if a skeptic, meaning someone who doesn't believe in telepathy, what if they do the same procedure? Well, in 2005, two psychology professors, both of whom said explicitly in their article that they did not believe in any kind of psychic ability, they, to their credit, did this same kind of experiment, the Sconsfeld experiment, and they reported that after eight studies, we had an overall statistically significant hit rate of 32%, which is the same hit rate that we've seen after 40 years of doing this experiment. But this was precariously close to demonstrating humans do have psychic powers, so they didn't believe their own results. And this is not too surprising. It raises the, the 
the reason why uh, there are two major categories of statistics ca that can be used to evaluate these effects. One is called frequentist, and that's what I had already talked about. The other one is Bayesian st statistics, and Bayesian statistics takes into account somebody's prior belief about an effect. So in this case, these were two professors who had no belief, had zero belief that telepathy could exist, and so they're from the Bayesian perspective, even though they did eight studies and they got the same result that everybody else did, that wasn't enough to push their belief into a category from it couldn't possibly be true to maybe it's true. This, the Bayesian analysis is also useful because it, it shows how subjective science is. Science is sometimes perceived as being purely fact-based and empirical, which it is, but the interpretation of the data is all over the map. It depends a lot on what you pr believe to be true. So I would say that from a purely empirical perspective where you try to pull back from uh, what your prior, belie prior beliefs are, that we have very strong evidence that telepathy exists. So there's something called a Bayes factor where you can do an analysis on a database and this, this letter K on the left there, that column K, so 10 to 0 is, is a 1. So if you have less than 1 base factor, it means that the strength of your evidence is negative. It's supporting the null hypothesis. If your strength of evidence is between 1 and the square root of 10, then the evidence is barely worth mentioning, and so on. So if you have evidence, a base factor of over 100 to 1, then the strength of the evidence is considered to be decisive. So what do we have in the case of the telepathy studies? Well, there was an article published a couple of years ago looking at uh, both classical and Bayesian views of the telepathy database. And this is the result, and the top line there is the Gansfeld. So the base factor is 18 million to 1. And remember, 100 to 1 is considered to be decisive evidence. And here we have 18 million to 1. Uh, you do a similar kind of analysis for remote viewing experiments. The, here you have 254 million to 1. Unless it maybe I made a mistake. Maybe that's 25 billion. Yeah, 25 billion to one, a base factor. So these are so far beyond what, what a Bayesian analysis would uh, suggest that, again, for people who say there's no evidence for these kinds of effects, they don't know the literature. By the way, this was published in a journal called Frontiers in Psychology. Uh, and you see in the very top there, impact factors two and a half, which for a journal is quite good. So this, this again, is uh, for academic psychologists if they pay attention to this literature, they'll see it's actually quite strong evidence. You may also note at the, the graph on the top, the table on the top shows Gansfeld is the first line. The second line, ASC, is altered states of consciousness. So there haven't been as many studies. Uh, and you look at the overall Bayes factor here, it's actually less than one, which means that from a Bayesian perspective, which is highly conservative, uh, altered states of consciousness experiments, psi experiments, don't provide very good evidence overall. Uh, and then there's, there are other, some categories provide incredibly good evidence and others do not. When you look at the preponderance of evidence, at least for telepathy, you find that prominent skeptics are now admitting that something interesting is happening because the data is, is, not, is undeniable. This is a comment from Richard Wiseman, who's a prominent British skeptic. He said in an interview with a newspaper, I think that these studies do meet the usual standards for a normal claim. In other words, if we lived in a paradigm where telepathy was accepted, where it was expected to occur, that the data would overwhelmingly say, yeah, this is the real effect. But because we live in a paradigm where telepathy is not necessarily known very well, uh, then it's not clear that we should accept it. So it's not a normal claim. In a sense, it's a paranormal claim. So telepathy looks pretty good. I could do the same kind of analysis for psychokinesis and for clairvoyance or remote viewing, but I'll focus for a moment now on precognition. So of the classes of uh, precognition experiments that I've done, I've done most of the different classes, this is one that I started in the mid-1990s. You hook somebody up to something very similar to a lie detector, uh, use skin conductance as shown in the image in the upper right, or you can use heart rate or uh, respiration, other measures. So you record a measure continually, and you sit somebody down in front of a computer screen and 
they look at nothing. And then they press a button when they feel they're ready to begin. For five seconds, again, they see nothing on the screen. At that point, the computer randomly selects a photo from a large pool of photographs. Uh, it's displayed for three seconds. The photo could be calm, like a bunny, or emotional, like a snake. Uh, that is, calm like a bunny, provided you're not frightened by bunnies. Uh, and if you're a herpetologist, then you wouldn't necessarily be frightened by a snake. But we do the best we can in selecting images that will push people's emotions in a direction of calm or emotional. And then the screen goes blank for 10 seconds. This is repeated 30 to 40 times, and that's one session. So this is a pretty fast experiment. It takes at most 20 minutes to do this whole experiment. Here's a, an example of you're sitting in front of a computer screen and you see an image, it's a calm image. Or you might see an image which is erotic or otherwise um, emotional but in a pleasant direction. And then you might see another calm image and these are selected at random. And maybe you see an emotional picture. So the question is, uh, after the picture appears, we know very well what happens to your physiology. So in the case of skin conductance, if you see an emotional picture, in roughly two and a half seconds, you get a big response, big sympathetic nervous system response. And when you see a calm image, you have a tiny response because you're, you're anticipating seeing something. So you see it finally, you have a little response, but clearly there's a big difference between the two. The question here from a precognition perspective is, what happens before the stimulus? Well, in this experiment, this is what we see. So if we, uh, if we set as a baseline your skin conductance level six seconds before the stimulus appears, then you see that uh, before the stimulus, if you're going to see an emotional picture, your body is already becoming emotional. And if you're going to see a calm image, your body remains relatively calm. So that difference, there's the, the average of emotional pictures, the average of the calm pictures. This difference here is what I call a presentiment response. It is an unconscious, precognitive feeling about what's about what's about to happen. When you ask people in these experiments, did you did you feel like you knew it was going to unfold? Most people would say no. They didn't have any sense about anything emotional about to happen, but unconsciously it's clear that their bodies were reacting anyway. So we've done this using many different measures. This is a, a version of the experiment using not emotional pictures, but simply whether a light flashed or didn't flash, and we look in the brain. So here's somebody doing this experiment where you have a, an electrode, a couple of electrodes, but the primary one we're interested in is on the top of their head. So what's happening in her brain? Well, here you see that if she sees a light flash, randomly timed and random, whether it's a flash or no flash, there's a big jump in the brain, which is well under understood. It takes about 300 milliseconds for that flash to reach, for the brain response to reach its maximum. But if you get no light flash, the brain remains calm. And this difference, this one second difference beforehand is statistically significant. So it says that even the brain is responding before the event unfolds. We've done this using pupil dilation. And again, you see a large difference in pupil dilation as to whether or not you're going to see an emotional picture. So far, every physiological measure that we've looked at, we see that there is a precursor effect. The body is unconsciously gearing up to experience something emotional or calm. Now, here's an example where we're looking at meditators using a form of meditation called non-dual meditation. And it's called that because the meditation style is to consider opposites or dualistic notions like here versus there, now versus then, me versus you, and to dissolve that dualism. So one of the things that happens in these kinds of meditations and this includes things like Zogchen and other types of meditation practice, is that they get a sense of timelessness. And so our, our interest here was, is that the feeling of timelessness an illusion, or is it actually ontologically correct? So we also then matched these meditators against controls who didn't have any meditation experience. So I'm speaking to you from Northern California, where it's very easy to find long-term meditators, and it's almost impossible to find controls. So we had to look around for a while. It's easy to find the meditators. It took a while to find people who are matched by gender and age who had no meditation experience at all. So in this case, we took 32 channels of brainwave activity, and we have randomly timed uh, stimuli of two types, either a light flash or a short audio beep. And these are using a true random number generator, so nobody knew in advance what they were about to, to perceive. 
what you get then is this. So just like we saw before, that after the stimulus, it's a well-known differences in how the brain responds to a light versus an audio tone. And you do see an effect. With the control subjects, you get a bigger response, which is not surprising because one of the things that meditation does is that it, it lowers your reactivity to the world. As a part of becoming calm inside and out, you simply don't react to, to uh, stimuli as strongly as you would otherwise. But the question is, what's happening beforehand? So in the controls, you see that the brain is not responding differently to a light flash or, not, or an audio tone, whereas in the meditators, there is a gigantic response. Statistically speaking, this is a huge difference. So this is a way of looking empirically at what meditators report, namely that they feel spread out in time, at least their intention is, or awareness is spread out in time, and their body reflects that. So their subjective sense now is showing objectively that they're spread out in time, whereas the controls without that kind of practice, this experiment didn't work for them. They, they don't show a major, a major difference. So I've done many experiments of this type, and all of these have been published in various places. But once again, we go through our due diligence list, and we say, well, could this be due to some kind of a clue that the person's getting about the upcoming image? Or maybe there's a cue in the sequence of images, and on and on and on. All these possibilities, and the bottom line, again, is, is it repeatable? The repeatability issue is an important one in science, and, and just in, in general, we want to know uh, if one laboratory keeps getting an uh, interesting result, maybe they're making an inadvertent mistake. Uh, as careful as you can be, it's always possible to make a mistake. So what do other people see? So fortunately, a lot of our colleagues uh, have, have also done this experiment. This one's by Dick Bierman, a professor now retired from the University of Amsterdam, who did the same kind of experiment in a functional MRI uh, with the idea of finding out where in the brain this presentiment result shows up. So first of all, they did get the similar result that, that I had found. The pink line there is showing an emotional picture, and the blue one is a non-emotional picture. So there's a significant difference before the image is randomly shown. And on the left, you can see where it actually shows up in the brain. And what's lighting up there is the amygdala. It's the portion of the brain that processes emotional information. So the amygdala is the portion of the brain that seems to be the one, not seems to, statistically speaking, it is the portion of the brain that is actually showing a response here. Well, in McCready at the Institute of Heart Math, their specialty is on heart, the heart. So they did experiments uh, before people meditated and after meditated using the heart along with emotional and calm pictures. And in both conditions, they found there was a significant difference. Uh, in this case, the emotional line is on the bottom because uh, when you see something emotional, your heart rate decelerates, goes down. So there's the presentiment results that they found. And so after about 20 years of doing these experiments and lots of replications, a colleague uh, of mine, Julia Mossbridge, who's now one of the staff members at, at uh, the Institute of Nordic Sciences, did a meta-analysis to look at all of these studies. Study This paper has been viewed in this high-impact journal 65,000 times. So I, I mention that because most papers in academic psychology are looked at a few hundred times. You're doing pretty well if, if you have a paper that's maybe looked at a thousand times. 65,000 times is extremely unusual. It means there's a huge amount of interest in this topic. In fact, in this case, it says it's among the highest scoring articles in this journal so far. The other thing I want to point out is that Jessica Utz is a statistician, the chair of the statistics department at the University of California at Irvine. And this year, she's the president of the American Statistical Association. So people who don't like the meta-analysis or they think we did a mistake or something, they have to answer to Jessica. So what did it find? They, used, they found 26 repeated experiments. Overall, the probability is 10 to the minus 12 that uh, we're seeing a real effect. This is a plot. The, the open circles here are the actual studies, and the black circles are, are uh, studies that are estimated to be missing from the, the database. So maybe they're not 26 experiments, but 20 six plus four, or 30 experiments, uh, and they would fit on the left side of, of that graph. But the, the bottom of this, uh, what's called a funnel plot, is a little white dot, and then there's a little black dot. Both of those show what the overall estimate 
effect is, both with and without the missing studies. And these are estimated missing studies. There probably aren't actually any missing studies. But the point is that both of those exclude zero, so there's a real effect going on. And this is simply a different way of looking at it, uh, different modes of looking at the data, different forms of expectation on the part of the experimenters, using different meta-analytic uh, models. Any way you look at this, there's a real effect going on. So now I'm going to talk about a different category of studies called Im uh, implicit decisions. And so what I'm doing by showing you this image again and again is priming you. And this is what social psychologists like to do. They will prime you with an idea or a picture or something. And then they'll make it go away so you, for you forget it consciously. They might show it again. They might do this a bunch of times, subliminally even. So you'll get it very quickly and just barely see it. And the reason you do that is because now you can do an experiment. You say, okay, which of these two students is more likable? Well, you've already been primed with one of the images. And if you do this in the, in the laboratory, you'll find that most people will end up choosing the image that they've already seen before, even if they've seen it subliminally and they don't know that they've seen it before. This is called the mere exposure effect. And it's, it's a well-known um, topic in social psychology, and it's used in advertising all the time. It's the reason why you see advertisements for Coke or Pepsi incessantly, whether it's on television or the way that it's shown in a grocery store, because advertisers know that if you simply expose somebody to something again and again and again, you internalize it after a while, and when you have to make a decision, you will go with the thing that's familiar. That's called the mere exposure effect. So the precognition experiment takes advantage of this effect, which is pretty strong, but it reverses it in time. So here's how it would work. Well, first of all, you can see the causal direction in this. You prime first, and then you make a decision. These are decisions in the present influenced by the past. So now we're going to reverse this effect. So the reversal says you start this with this point. Which student is more likable? And you devise the experiment in such a way so that you have judges look at pairs of images, and you match them so that the likability is 50% on average. So there wouldn't be any bias in these two cases. But you have to make a decision. So you'll say, okay, I don't know. I'll say that one's more likable. Well, now you make a random decision. You toss the dice, and you select one of those two images, and now you present the, uh, the prime. But the prime is after you've made your decision. So what we've done is we've taken the future prime and see if it ripples backwards in time to influence your original decision. This is a retrocausal influence. It is suggesting that a decision in the present is influenced by a future prime. This is called an implicit form of precognition because you're not telling people that this is a precognition experiment. You're simply having them select pictures. Well, Dao Robam is a colleague at Cornell University. And a number of years ago, he published nine studies overall showing extremely strong evidence that this kind of paradigm where you take ordinary well understood experiments in social psychology, but you reverse it in time, you get a precognition effect. This was reported in the New York Times before the paper was actually published in an unusual editorial where the, everyone was expected, be expected to be outraged because a journal is publishing a paper on ESP that worked. And the reason uh, why this made the New York Times is because uh, the journal it was published in is one of psychology's top journals. And so you're not, this, this uh, upset people who believe that ESP cannot exist. And so why are these journals publishing such a thing, which is obviously outrageous? And the editorial goes on to say that this would, of course, delight believers in so-called paranormal events, but it would mortify scientists. Which, of course, is a, a thinly veiled insult because it suggests that if you uh, report positive results, you can't be a scientist. Well, Daryl Bam is a very famous scientist. Uh, nevertheless, this article in the Times reflected the, the way the mainstream views these kinds of things. The bottom line, once again, is, is this a repeatable effect? Well, Daryl did a very clever thing. He selected a kind of experiment, he designed the experiment, and then provided uh, materials so that anybody could repeat it. All you would need would be a computer. So about two or three years after his study was reported, uh, there were 90 replications of this original experiment, which is great. It's unusual to get that many replications so quickly. And here's the, a list of them all. And you can see 
that the, the thin blue line is zero, which means there's no effect, and the red line is where the overall average is. And this is not anywhere near at chance. Just like you see with the Gunsfeld experiment, sometimes the experiment works and sometimes it doesn't work, and it's highly sensitive to the context, to the conditions, and so on. And human behavior varies all over the place as well. And the value of a meta-analysis is that you can see what happens on average when many people try the experiment, and the answer is it works. So this is from the paper. The important thing here is, is this, that all experiments together show probability of 10 to the minus 10th, that this is a real effect, and you can do a Bayes analysis, and you have 5 billion to 1, which, again, remember that 100 to 1 Bayes factor is considered to be a decisive outcome. So this is way more than decisive outcome. Uh, and then if you only look at, uh, don't consider the experiments that Daryl Bem did, but only people who did it independently, you still end up with a base factor of 3,800 to 1, where 100 to 1 is decisive. So there are four categories of evidence for precognition. I talk a little bit about, about psychophysiology methods and implicit decisions, but there are also historical ones looking at forced choice and remote viewing studies looking at free response, and the odds against chance are gazillions to 1. Uh, what's happening more recently now is that in psychology and uh, social psychology, there's uh, a great gnashing of teeth over whether the effects, uh, famous effects in psychology can replicate, and there's some evidence that they don't replicate as well as people think they should. And this raises the possibility of what's called questionable research practices. Uh, this ranges from selective reporting of data to selective publication to optional stopping to doing a post hoc analysis but not reporting it as such, something called p-hacking, where the, the goal in psychology is to get a result that is a probability of less than 0.05. And if you start fiddling with the data, you try to hack away at the results to try to get 0.05. If you, let's say you got a result that was 0.06, it's like almost really good. So you, you make a decision, well, I'll get rid of a couple of subjects and oh, now I have a significant result. Well, that's not a legitimate thing to do unless you tell people. So. These experiments have been looked back retrospectively to see, to estimate whether questionable research practices can account for these very strong results. And to make a long story short, the answer is no. It, one of the reasons is that parapsychology has been under the, the uh, skeptical gun for so many years that the nature of the design and execution of these experiments is actually a lot better than it is in academic psychology. So we've known about the, the biasing effects of questionable research practices for many, many years, decades, and we don't do that. So the results stand. So what we're talking about here are perceptions unlimited by space and time. A skeptic cat is not sure. In addition, even though an increasing number of these studies have been published in mainstream journals, we have the same problem that Galileo had, in, uh, that people generally don't want to look at the evidence. And I can't blame academics for doing this, because uh, we can't all be experts in everything. And even if uh, in your, a journal in your expertise, you'll get one once a month or however often it comes, the likelihood that you're going to read every article in detail is very, very low. Most people read a title of a, of a journal article, and if they're really lucky, they, they might read the abstract. Almost nobody reads the entire article. Now, in this case, we have a paradox, because people, including academics, are very interested in things like precognition. So they get the article, they download it. As we see, 65,000 people downloaded the meta-analysis. Uh, but people who read it in detail and understand it, it's, it's more unusual. So how do we explain any of this stuff? Well, it basically boils down to two underlying theories. The first theory is the mainstream concept of what consciousness is. And if you go to the Society for Neuroscience, the SFN.org, that's the largest neuroscience organization in the world. Their annual conferences attract typically around 30,000 people. And, and this is the mainstream. This is a brochure that you can get from that society. And it basically says you're nothing but a pack of neurons, and you're a machine made of meat. This is the prevailing view in the neurosciences, and from this view, it basically says that everything having to do with consciousness and self-awareness and all that is a result of processing in the brain. 
this is comes out of the tradition of science, which is known as reductive materialism. And the way it works is pretty simple, that we imagine that when we put together a knowledge structure or, or a hierarchy of the way things work, the bottom of the pyramid is physics. This is matter, energy, space, and time. That's what we're all sitting upon. And then what emerges from that is chemistry, and emerges from that is biology, and then psychology, and somewhere at the top of this pyramid is consciousness or awareness. All of this, then, the, the arrow of causation is strictly in this case, going up, upward causation, and things emerge. So psychology emerges from biology, awareness emerges from the brain. So that's the model that, uh, and causation is unidirectional. This is the model that most scientists work under most of the time, and at least within the Western world, this is the way that we think things ought to work. So the reason why precognition and clairvoyance and uh, all of the other psychic phenomena are so difficult for scientists to accept is that this model has been inculcated into us from practically day one. And this is this is how we think the world works. And it puts awareness at the opposite end of this emergence network from basic physics. So we know if you go far down enough in physics, especially down in the quantum physics, you end up with all kinds of very strange effects. But because our awareness seems from this model to be so far away from uh, the quantum world, that people say, no, it's not, I, I might accept that non-locality exists in the quantum world, but it couldn't possibly exist at the level of awareness, because it would require that the brain is a quantum object. Well, it comes about as a result of this model. Uh, and of course, you have interactions at the different levels of the hierarchy, but they don't interact very far. You don't generally think of psychology in terms of physics. You might in terms of biology. So the other theory is this, consciousness is fundamental. The, this comes out of the, the Far East traditions like Vedanta or uh, the Western tradition of idealism, uh, otherwise known as panpsychism or neutral monism. At first glance, it's the same kind of pyramid as we saw before, the same structure involved. You don't need to throw away any, any textbooks. What you do need to do is take awareness and put it at the base. And I could have used the word consciousness and put it down at the base. Uh, this model now says that, among other things, awareness permeates the entire structure. Just as elementary physics, like electrons, can be found in chemistry and biology and psychology, physics permeates everything above. Well, in this case, awareness permeates everything. This, the top part of the pyramid from physics on is still an emergence model, but there are interactions between these, uh, these different categories. But I use a different term, uh, precipitation to indicate how do we get from awareness into the physical world. Another term that people are using now is manifestation, that if you start from pure consciousness or pure awareness, you manifest or precipitate out of that substance the rest of the world as we see it. The whole structure falls out. Of, out. So from all that, I could say that nothing about the extraordinary capacities of consciousness actually makes any sense at all unless consciousness is fundamental in some important way. So this is where we are. Uh, back in 1934, uh, Sir Arthur Eddington, famous physicist, said it's difficult for the matter-of-fact physicist to accept the view that the substratum of everything is of mental character. He's talking about this second knowledge pyramid. So that was 1934. Here's 2005, and you get a similar article, The Mental Universe, The Only Reality is Mind and Observations. But observations are not of things. Or to see the universe as it really is, we must abandon our tendency to conceptualize observations as things. Physicists shy from the truth because the truth is so alien to everyday physics, the universe is entirely mental. Well, you can find lots of essays like this. Uh, the reason why I mention this particular one is because it was published in Nature. So Nature and Science are the two top journals in science. People pay a lot of attention to this. And the fact that the editors at Nature thought it was interesting to publish this essay, I think, indicates that uh, there's a, a paradigm shift underway. Because otherwise they would have said, this is ridiculous. Nobody would even believe that. You find now an increasing number of people uh, who are not associated with the study of consciousness previously. Max Tegmark is a well-known physicist at MIT who wrote this article, and here it's reported by the PBS, of consciousness as a state of matter. And so he's basically saying that uh, just as there are many types of liquids, maybe there are many types of consciousness, because consciousness may be a kind of matter. What he doesn't say is, if consciousness is thought of as a state of matter, then matter 
is a state of consciousness. Well, that is, is, that's what we've been talking about here, is putting consciousness as a more fundamental level than matter itself. You find uh, now uh, Tononi, who is another a physicist, and Christoph Koch, who is a neuroscientist, again talking about consciousness as a fundamental property possessed by physical systems. And this one in the, uh, from the Royal Society. Though all of this is new, like within the past five years or so that you start seeing this. Scientific American, complex theory of consciousness pointing to a panpsychic view of consciousness. So again, this is beginning to penetrate the mainstream. And it suggests something like this. So, what does all this have to do with pragmatics? One of the pragmatics has to do with health and healing. And in particular, that if our basic assumption within science has been somewhat wrong, and reductive materialism is not quite true, and we live more in a panpsychic or neutral monist kind of reality, and in particular, if mental things or consciousness things literally manifest the way that the world works, then it suggests that uh, as we see a little bit in the placebo effect, that if you have an expectation of a health outcome, then that will happen. Uh, what we don't know at this point is if the, a mainstream view came about eventually in science, that consciousness really is more fundamental in, than the physical world, then that might accelerate or enhance the placebo effect to a, a wildly larger degree than we currently know, in which case uh, you can have faith based on evidence that if you change your mind, you may be able to manifest a different outcome in your body. Uh, at this point, it's very difficult to test that other than through studies of the placebo effect uh, because we are still living in a society where a lot of people say, no, you, the way to fix your body is taking a drug. And if you're lucky, the placebo will help a little bit, but you can't manifest something directly. Well, we know that there are lots of studies now suggesting that actually you can push the physical world around a little bit, uh, purely through your own intention. And I th as I said, I think that, that the ability for us to do that will change as society begins to recognize that we're actually living in a different paradigm now. So I'm going to stop there, and I think we'll have some time for questions, which I'll be very happy to answer if I can. Rosanna Schaefer Shaw here, and uh, I wonder if you could speak for a moment to the idea that we might have uh, some effect on our own body, but what about the effect, either good or negative, that others, or a prevailing view, as you were kind of edging into towards the end, might have on an ind individual system, such as myself? Or anybody's self. <laughs> Are you saying what is the effect of other people's intentions on your body? Basically, yes. Uh, and and um, as people realize that they could have intentions on others, or effects on others, how do you see that? You know, sort of speak to that, because the question is a little amorphous. Right. Yeah. So, we, we know from studies looking at uh, distant healing, that at least within the laboratory context, that uh, one person's uh, intentions directed at you will push your body around. We see that primarily in nervous system responses, but it, it's, a, it's a real interaction. So, if you expand out of the laboratory and you simply look at the world at large, uh, what do we do with that if you have uh, a billion people on the other side of the planet who don't like you very much? I'm talking here about uh, a, a concept of a jihad, where you are justified in fighting somebody for, for some reason. Uh, does that make an effect on all of our behavior, our health, and so on? I think the answer is clearly yes, it does. So world peace cannot be achieved, even and forget peace, world calm cannot be achieved as long as there are people out there who are holding uh, ideas that they want to harm you, because some of that negative intent will affect everyone. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Hi, I'm Chris Van Kleempert. Um, many years ago, I came across the Maharishi effect, which uh, states that in order to influence a group, uh, if you put like a group of meditators, you need like 1% uh, 
uh, to influence, like you need one person to influence a group of 100 people and that will reduce uh, violence and that kind of stuff. If you have even more synchronized meditators, you could even go to the square root of the population that you need to influence. Did you ever do research on what kind of influence people or as a group can generate and how that would work fundamentally? Uh, I haven't done that kind of research. Uh, the, <clears throat> the reason is that uh, I admire what the TM people have done because when you, you're doing research involving something as slippery as uh, demographics of a society and crime statistics and so on, there's so many factors involved that you need to be an expert in knowing how to deal with that kind of information. And I, I'm not an expert in that. I don't. I don't. I wouldn't know how to do an experiment properly that was looking at something like crime statistics. So the analog that we use of that is with random number generators in our, our studies involving field consciousness effects, as we call them. And we see effects that would be consistent with what the, the TM people have seen. What we don't know at this point is whether it really is the square root of the population, the square root of the number of meditators. As far as I can tell, and I've, I've asked John Hagelin, uh, who's now the head of the TM uh, movement, where did, where did the Maharishi come up with the square root of some number? And John has no idea. He just pulled it out of the sky. So maybe that number is correct, and maybe it isn't correct. Uh, but the, the notion that a group of meditators can change the environment in some way, and the people in the surround, I think is reasonably well established by the, the TM studies. OK, thank you very much. Dean, thank you so very much. Fascinating presentation. We appreciate your generosity, your time, your expertise, and we'll look forward to your next book, too. Thank you right. very, very much. Thank you.